Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. For more information, visit them on the web at tenable.com. ProXPN is the leading VPN service, offering free accounts, excellent premium features, and an outstanding commitment to privacy and security online. Use the discount code WEEKLY and save 50% off for life. NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with a proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email them at contact at netsparker.com. Overwhelmed when it comes time to choose which cigar to smoke? Confused by the differences between 60 Ring Gauge, Robusto, Corona, and Lancero? Do you yearn to try all the new cigars on the market, but need a guide to tell you where to start? Look no further than the Stogie Geek Show, hosted by yours truly and Will Cooper. We've made it our mission to educate both new and experienced cigar smokers. Tune in for interviews with leaders in the cigar industry, how-to segments, and weekly cigar reviews. Visit stogiegeeks.com to subscribe to our podcast, watch the live show, and discover our video archives. Stogie Geeks, geeks kicking ash. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly. This is the security news for this week. What do you guys think about Pokemon Go? It's been wow. Like, I think my kids are addicted. That's what I think. <laughs> it's like the new thing. I don't pretend to understand it all that well. I haven't. Uh, uh, okay, like I've got, a, I've got a confession. I installed it. Okay. And so, what? Like, what do you do? You walk around and try and find. Well, so you walk. It's capturing Pokemon critters using your screen, um, but it is GPS linked. So it it is. A map of the quote unquote real world with Pokemon and Pokemon artifacts overlaid. So, like, if you go to a specific GPS location, Pokemon puts like a thing that you collect there? Yeah, well, there's this thing that the, the Pokemon critters show up on the map, and the Pokemon critters on the map are, you know, on your street or your block or your park or wherever you are. Um, and then um, the there's this concept of Pokemon stops where they give out the Pokeballs. You have to have Pokeballs to capture a Pokemon. I don't, I don't want anyone poking my balls. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That Pokemon. sounds like it hurts. <laughs> so these Pokeballs, you can collect at these Pokemon stops. And this is what I've learned from both having the app and actually my daughter telling me that I'm not old and stupid, right? <laughs> um and you go to the, the Pokestops and get your Pokeballs because you run out of Pokeballs to capture the Pokemon. <laughs> Santa Cangelo's losing it. He just, <laughs> just he lost it. It was like the sixth time you said Pokemon but, balls, but it's, Pokeballs. It's, uh, yeah, that it's, was it. Look, it's, it's, like, it's like crack. Does anyone it's, have any other <laughs> Anybody who's Which a is Star just Trek adjacent fan. to the Pokeballs. No, no, hold on, hold on a second. If you were a Star Trek fan, that do you remember in, there was the spot there was an in between episode, there was a, hang on. There was an episode in Star Trek uh, Star Trek Next Generation where the entire crew got addicted to this game that had this visual yeah, I remember that thing, episode. Right? Do you remember that? Oh my god. I have a segue that, and we're talking about Star Trek. Dude, I'm like on nerd playing one thousand right now. Right. Nerd 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 badges all I'm like in. I'm almost in the dork category, dude. Like I'm like, like, like yeah. Like, Pokemon Go is in fact very similar to that episode. It actually uh, does win. Interesting. Yeah, so that's why people are now people are having road accidents and stuff because they're stopping to collect rare Pokemon in the middle of fucking highway while they're driving. Jesus. Now the good one was two days ago when the guy slammed into the parked cop car while playing. Cop car. Yeah. yeah. That was that was my favorite so far. Well, well yeah, and it's it, just really funny is when they get the cops involved and then the cops start playing Pokemon with them. And it's like this whole social phenomena going on. It's crazy. Well, and then some hacker group, like, dosed the Pokemon thing. Did you guys see that? 
a hacker group. Yeah, but that's boring. Let's talk about hacking it to win. I mean, let, let's talk yeah, about let's, cheating, that, not just that, dossing the server. That's well, not well, fun. I did see an so, article so about Rick, sp spoofing your GPS location, and you can collect more poke. <clears throat> poke you can poke. That, that's poke quite your, popular. You can poke more balls. Go you ahead. can poke so, your balls so, more. I see. So I, I've started down this route a little bit. I, I'm not quite there yet, but I, of course, if it, uh, invoked my interception proxy uh, for my Pokemon app and started examining the protocol. So I'm, I'm going to keep going down this route in my quote-unquote spare time. Mm. Um, but yeah, <laughs> hack the uh, Pokemon Go game for the win is definitely my goal. Yeah, so there's a couple of really good cheats that I've seen so far. Um, I'm going to go in reverse order because it's actually funnier that way. Uh, the most recent ones I've been seeing are maps that actually have where all of the Pokemon spawn points are, and they're basically overlays on Google Maps. So you can scroll around where wherever you are, and, and you can just find, okay, I want to find this Pokemon. Here's the nearest spawn point, and then you can drive over there. But before that, they figured out how to do GPS spoofing with SDR. And being a actually, radio guy, that's been something I've been following for a while, and that's just hmm. great. Complete Actually, GPS simulation with an so, SDR is awesome. So you well, don't, you I, I'd don't like have to, to just work out the API so I can increment the amount of incense I have. There's a thing called Pokemon incense. So if we can bump I'll up, you turn into a hippie. Wait, hold on. Do you burn the incense while you poke yeah. your balls? Is yes, that... you, you can burn the incense to attract Pokemon. <laughs> yeah. So if, and, if I can, if I can, you know, go ahead and increment that to oh I've got God. like two thousand incense. Uh, bundles to burn. I can, you know, have some fun with it. But uh, I'm so glad that, that actually brings me back to the first two cheats that I saw. Mm. Uh, <laughs> the second cheat that I saw was they don't do any kind of certificate verification at all, and in the middle of the whole thing, and change what the server's telling you, change what you're telling the server. You know, if you're bored. Um, exactly. The very <laughs> first thing I saw, though, is still the funniest. They did nothing to obfuscate the code when they built the APK, and you can just download it and change it, <laughs> unpack it, and change it as you see fit, wow. and then repackage it, and guess what? Still playable. So there's a lot of constants in there like, well, if you walk 200 meters, you'll, you'll hatch your Pokemon egg or whatever it is. I haven't actually played the game first code. You can really cheat by just recompiling the thing with some favorable settings. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, incense spawns uh, Pokemon every minute or every 200 meters that you walk or something like that. But you could change that to every second or you, one meter that you walk. You know what's or, really or cool? Like if I actually recompile the APK and um, it, it's, it's really cool and suddenly my kids will like me again. So. Mm. Yeah, it's good. Well, you'll be you'll be the only one with all of the Pokemon. It'll be pretty popular at a lot of conventions, I think. <laughs> That's, um, it's pretty interesting um, how and this was a Google pro Google owns the company that created this app or something. Niantic. Yeah, uh, it was a Google company, and they spun off when they started making Ingress. I gotcha. I mean, it's just interesting how uh, some of the mistakes they made are, are probably not ones you want to make in your own software company or or startup. Uh, and it goes to show you that people, and I think we deal with this on a daily basis, uh, those of us in security, nobody thinks that people are going to do bad things with the things you create. Yep. And here we just rambled off a list of things. Hey, when they came out with this, look, people started using it. And guess what? Hackers started using it, not in the way it was intended to be used, which is the definition of Surprise. hacking. Surprise! <laughs> and look what happened. It, the funny thing is, is it's all our fault, too. So, like, Niantic has ingress, and they've had it for years, and it's not nearly as damaging to the world, honestly, as, as Pokemon has been, because there are things like if you're going more than 40 miles an hour, you can't play. Granted, I think yeah. it should probably be a little bit lower, but it prevents major <laughs> catastrophes, right? Uh, they've got things that prevent you from GPS warping. They'll basically punish you. They won't let you play the game for a few minutes if you GPS warp. Uh, the Pokemon app was built by the same company and doesn't have any of that stuff, Interesting. which is really weird yeah, because weird. you'd think they'd learn from their mistakes, but when the deadlines are pressing down on you, you just you don't have time to go back and do the things that you know you should do. Right, and that's that's been a problem. 
That's well, it. And, and you know, ahead, so Mark. that's interesting because if you look at that from a security perspective, I mean, Paul, you and I now for what four or five weeks now have been doing the startup show, yeah, which and, is really and starting to talk about these things to say, hey, you got to consider it. Now someone's gonna go, well, Pokemon Go. Right. Yeah. All right. My bad. It just it throws money yeah. over fist. It throws our line. whole conversation like right on top of it. Like like completely turns it over, Michael. Because here we're saying we preach on Startup Security Weekly, which is going to be releasing in the next week or so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, very really. You know what the embarrassing part is? The reason it hasn't released is because we didn't get around to picking the music that we wanted for the theme song. Which now we have an awesome we theme song. It. Let me just say, it you is, and I need to show up in neon and like white sports. Oh, hat. it is like bass in your face. <laughs> it's awesome. Wait, it was wor- It's oh, going to be oh. worth the wait. I'm telling you. I, you but you've got to give me a preview. We will. And Not it, now. <clears throat> it's um, you know we talk about how you should educate your developers, put security in from the start. Here's a company that did that, but then their second project, they're like, wow, we can make a crap load of money with the second project. Let's get it out there and, and throw security out the window. Now they didn't come out and say throw security out the window, but like Rick was saying, like their developers were like, well, we get we get this code out. Because it's do basically, you know it's going to save the company, right? We're going to make so much money. From, Rick, did they start this from scratch? Do you know? I have no idea. I'm just assuming because there's so many safety features built into Ingress that aren't in Pokemon Go. Mm. I doubt they intentionally removed it. Well, yeah, so it's, um, but then it's almost like, they did they buy it from somebody? Did somebody else start it or something? It could be. Because, no, I mean, just to your point, there's so much built into Ingress. It's kind of like, you're like, wait, what? But, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of fascinating. All right, so let's... Let's look at a different part of the security side to it. We've started to see a lot of places now put up signs that say there's no – in fact, what I thought was fascinating was the National Guard in South Carolina put up a post and said, hey, you know what? There, you guys are trying to come to some of our protected installations. Our MPs are armed. That's a really bad idea on your part, so please don't. Um, d- who's got liability for that? And, and is that a smart strategy? I mean, like if we're a company doing these things or if you're a company, I mean – from a security perspective, even though a lot of us aren't necessarily responsible for physical security, do you necessarily want your company showing up as a, as a spot? Like, how does that work, guys? Because uh, to be fair, that, I that one actually came up with Ingress, too. There, there's a lot of places where you go to, you know, hack portals or, or whatever you're doing in Ingress that are public spots, especially churches are very popular, uh, you know, places like post offices. But sometimes they're not a post office or it's not a church and you pull into like some dude's driveway in the middle of the night and that's already been a pretty big problem with Pokemon because it's a a much more popular game uh, very, very quickly. So people are doing stupid things that they shouldn't do like climbing into enclosures in the zoo to catch Pokemon or going past a gate that says no trespassing, we're armed. Uh, I, I think, honestly, eugenics... I mean, I just oh, hope well, that you do those things before Darwin you have children. <laughs> the Darwin Awards live. Yeah. Oh, the Darwin edition. Um, yeah, I mean that 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 liability has to fall on you. I mean, when you pull into somebody's wow. driveway at three o'clock in the morning, that's that's on you, man. You know, you know, it is. It's it's a live Darwin Awards experiment. That that is crazy. Yeah, that, we we don't have enough food to feed the hungry, so you know, more Pokemon Go will take care of it. We'll make a giant Poke Stop. Hey. In uh, an impoverished country. Now, now you're just feeding into the conspiracy. Theory. Oh no, no, we're, we're, we're going <laughs> way, way down the road. Well, well, speaking of uh, speaking of conspiracy theories, let's talk a little bit about Stuxnet. I know Stuxnet. So, like, what six, seven, eight years ago, or whenever it was, um, but this guy Alex Gibney created yep. a movie called Zero Days about it. I don't think it's been released yet, has it, Michael? No, I thought it was. Is it released? Yeah. I saw an advertisement yeah. for it, like on Showtime or something. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go watch it, but it, it, obviously you know what, I, I've been busy watching Silicon Valley. Oh, thank you, but finally. And you're so right. It's, it's, it's called Zero Days. Zero That's Days. Zero Days. Yeah. Um, and it's about and it heavily involves the two guys that were researchers for Symantec, right? Eric Chin Chine and Liam something. Yeah, uh, Liam, Eric and Liam. <laughs> Eric and Liam. Yeah, I, I'm not uh, Liam o- Omerchu or no, we were good at Eric and Liam. You're good. Eric and Liam. Uh, Zero Days uh, is coming out. Which why so much time has passed? Do we still have to talk about Stuxnet? So much so that we have a whole movie about it. I don't understand. 
Because I think Stuxnet is the one that crossed that chasm. That's the one where we did something that, that could potentially go out and dismantle something in the physical space. I think it's interesting from an Allure perspective because the lineage of it is, is at least traced back or largely to believe the U.S., you know, government created, released. And so now you're getting into a lot of ethical issues and it's an interesting technical crossover. And so there's some fascination around it. I, I think it's. I actually think it's an interesting topic. You know, I, I had thrown this into the news uh, a while ago when this first came out. So I'm I'm kind of glad to see it come back because I was curious your your take on it. And to be fair, I haven't watched the movie yet. But all right. So so you don't think it? I mean, should I infer from the way you set that up that this is not necessarily worth talking about? I I think. I don't know if it's so much worth. I, I think it's worth talking about uh, what the next versions and variants and malware such as Stuxnet that does similar things are going to be not so much about Stuxnet itself and probably to the, the, the filmmakers uh, credit that um, it, it could be it sounds like that's more what it's going to be about um, it was one of the most prolific and I think uh, changing pieces of malware probably ever to be created I mean, it's got to be. A pre- yeah, that, that, it set that's a precedent. It. Oh, it's right up there with the Morris worm. You just yeah. nailed it. It set a precedent that that um, changed the uh, landscape of uh, you know software-based uh, warfare, essentially, and and that that is uh, and will continue to have ripples. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I think I, I think it does I think it does have merit, and I you know the other documentary films that I've watched that um, cover uh, events that have happened in our industry are very much spot on in that realm, right? There was a documentary about Snowden, and certainly the Snowden leaks changed a whole lot of things, not just about security but privacy and uh, and all sorts of issues. Uh, it is John mentioned in the interview it changed the trust model that people had with with the cloud. Um, there's been documentaries about Anonymous uh, and LawSec, and certainly that changed, I think, the way a lot of organizations think about security. Uh, to this day, there are there's a whole industry that was really, I think, spawned from that about um, you know th- threat intelligence in the sense of getting information about the, you know they label it the dark web. You know, we'll give you information about the dark net so you can determine if you've been breached before you're really breached. Which I, I don't put a whole lot of merit in, but lo and behold, there's a, a ton of companies now in that uh, arena, and I think it's largely stemming from uh, groups like Anonymous and, and LawSec and the like. So, you know, I think uh, these movies are, are important for us to watch because it's where what we do crosses into mainstream, and that's largely the issues that uh, we're addressing. And, and even, I think, largely Stuxnet crossed into mainstream uh, in a big way, and we need to pay attention to that and make sure that the perceptions are, are dealt with in a, in a correct manner. You know, let me let me tag something on, and at the risk of uh, signing myself up for some work here, um, I, I've been I've been re-scanning this article and looking at it. And what's interesting is that this does cover some of the policy implications and the decisions. So obviously, we know I focus on leadership and I focus on executives and boards. This might be one of those types of movies that we need to be comfortable talking about, not dismissively, but to say, yeah, and hey, boss, here's three things we should chat about, or let me offer you this, or here's the analog. So, I, so, I, so I'm kind of curious for two things for the people who watch the show. Would that be useful to you uh, if, if we took time, took a look at it, and came up with some speaking points, and we could either make it like a non-tech tech segment or, or something else um, and give people some of those insights? And or if you've watched it, is yeah, this the of kind it? of thing that, yeah, that you'd want to have as a discussion point? Like, is this a good thing to bring into the enterprise and say, well, if you've seen the movie Zero Days, here's some stuff to talk about? Because if so, I'll spend the time on it. And if yeah. not, you know, no worries. You well, know, no. You know uh, here's gotcha. a follow on to that really quick, um, uh, Mike. Uh, the, the, it's not just about what talking points we could get out of it but also dissecting what is uh, myth and Hollywood screenwriter uh, versus uh, reality. Uh, and I yeah. think that's a really important aspect that, you know, uh, you know, Hollywood, bless them, I mean, they're doing, they're doing what they do, right? Well, they're I totally think Swordfish is accurate, yeah. but the other movies, not so much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, I, no, but, but you, you've got to, I think, Michael, you probably understand this more than us who are sort of, you know, you know knuckles deep uh, practitioners, certainly me anyway, that 
people believe this stuff, right? And, and I'm, I'm, I know there's some very smart execs out there, but, but some of them are probably consuming this stuff and going, oh, I wonder if that's actually real. Well, we need to, you know, you know, we need to way, encourage them to watch Mr. Robot because that's another story that I have. Well, yeah, Dude, I was gonna say there is like the most epic friggin' Easter egg in this show. There is a screenshot from a set, and they're connecting to an IP address. When you connect to that IP address, there's like a whole puzzle. There's something. There's some. It looks like Base 64. Yep, Base 64 encoded string that converts to a Thomas Jefferson quote. There's a whole list of DNS names that were extrapolated from that um, by inspecting the SSL certificate that was posted. All this is in a link in the show notes. Um, there's a, a, a puzzle at one of those websites, and there's some Morse code in one of those puzzles that someone translated to leave me here. Uh, you know, so I mean, th well, there's two awesome. interesting things about this. Um, you know, Paul, you were with me at InfoSec World this year. Mm. Simon, did, Simon Singh did his talk about smuggling math into The Simpsons, and he was giving us all this really deep, rich, technical math stuff. And I, you know, I went and wrote about that, and it was kind of like, wow, like there you go. That's what we need to do with security: smuggle it in. Look what Mr. Robot's doing. Same mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. But you know, I was going to point out the other example that I was always impressed by, who nailed this right, was um, oh my, I just went blank. What was the spy show on USA Network uh, with Burn Michael notice. Weston? Burn Notice. They always they they could take a concept and they would break it down. I swear, sixty seconds or less. And you'd watch and be like, oh, I get check kiting now. Oh, I understand this aspect of it. And I always thought, you know, if you needed an example to go to, they were the ones, they, they did the work, they figured it out, and they were able to tell the story. To go back to your point, Jofton, you know, people see it and believe it. It's not so much that they believe it. It's that it's the closest thing they can relate to. We've done such a good job of being able to tell that story that it feels real. So it's not, it's not whether somebody believes it or disbelieves it. It's that that's the closest thing they have that makes any sense. Yeah, but I mean, so we so, can replace it with more logic or, or a better uh, motion. Exactly, exactly. That's what I was going for. It's like, okay, so there's a framework laid and it's believable at some some level. Now, how can we help translate that into reality? Yeah, like hacking 128 bit encryption with just like two touch screens. I guess that's probably not. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, because, in, in, in props you know, to Michael Bazell who came on the show, um, yeah. who's uh, the technical advisor for Mr. Robot and. Um, he said there was some awesome stuff coming, and, and he certainly wasn't lying. No, yeah, this is pretty awesome. Wow, He's done a spectacular job, honestly. I, I think all of us watch that show with a very critical eye. And not only is, is what they're doing reasonably believable, but, but it's actually technically accurate when you go back and look at the, the screens. I mean, the amount of time that guy must spend on that stuff is unreal. Because it's a lot of fun for the the nerds to watch and the regular people, which is cool. Yeah. Now, Michael, yeah, that, that's really that's a really good point. The fact that they can actually pull it off with the amount of time invested and get it to appeal to the nerds and geeks as well as be entertaining mm. that's a trick. I mean, that that's really cool. Now, Michael, you said you watched Silicon Valley. How close is that to the startup culture, in your opinion, being very close to that? <laughs> Too close. I have to admit, there were some pieces. As you warned me, there were some pieces now that I looked at. I was like, "Wow, <laughs> okay." It's, they uh, they did a good job. I know it was parody, but uh, there were some parts that felt scary. Make the world a better place. Yeah, Michael. that's my, that's gonna be my new line now from now on. Did you get to the last episode of season one yet? Oh gosh, no. I'm still like in the oh, first okay. episode. Okay. Okay. Once you get there, after you watch that episode. We need to have a conversation, which will end up in hilarity. I promise okay. you. Right. It is it probably. Might be, it might not be by tomorrow, but by next. That's weekend. fine. I'm, I'm going to go on a limb and say um, it is probably the hardest I've ever laughed, and I still laugh about it to this day. Like I, I giggle in my head when I think about that episode. It is probably one of for nerds and geeks. It is one of the funniest moments ever to be captured on television or movies. Uh, tailor to that audience. It is. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ruin it, but I have to say that scene in the last episode that mm -hmm. you're talking about. If you look up, there is actually a academic paper really? from that scene. They went through. Uh, it's got like the actors' names on it and everything. There's an academic paper. Oh, they detailing published the, the discussion that they had. Oh, I'm gonna have to go read fantastic. that. Uh, that yeah. Yeah. Now, now I have look it up. It's fantastic. It. <laughs> it's unreal. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I like that we had a lot of movies and TVs uh, shows to talk about 
on this episode. It makes for uh, for good for good podcasting as well as hey, good hey, hey, yeah, Star but it's also Trek, Star Trek's I mean, out. This is the thing I always point out. They're good. They're good discussions because, like, the beauty of like a Mister Robot is it's a very small set of their audience that's going to catch those references. Yeah, and and that's that's the brilliance of it. But it's popular. Look, if it wasn't making money and it wasn't popular, they wouldn't keep it on air. It wouldn't have made it to a second right, season. Right, right, right. And because it's technically accurate, it lets us go have conversations back in our own enterprises. Like, we're having conversations about it. The level might go up a little bit. We might be a little less into the geeky side of it. But gosh, what, what a great way to stimulate some conversations. Yeah, if I could go on a short tangent about television yeah. shows, um, if you like the Easter eggs in Mr. Robot, a completely opposite would be Archer. It's not <laughs> technically accurate in any way, but they still hide millions of Easter eggs in they there, do. and there's just layers upon layers of – I mean, it's, it's challenges for hackers, man, but we're not the prime targets for the show. I don't understand it, but it's – it's pretty awesome there too. Archer has references to not just technology, but really every subject in the entire world. Archer will reference in almost every line, and that's one of the. It is the most. It, it's interesting because it's the most idiotic and juvenile show uh, ever to appear on television at an intellectual level like that, where. The show is idiotic and hilarious, but every line is a reference to something. I find myself Google searching every time I watch Archer to be like, what was that reference? I didn't, and then I'm like, oh, now it's funny. And I go back and watch the episode again. It's even funnier. Um, so Archer is amazing. And there's some funny technology things in there. Uh, there's one about passwords in, in Archer that's just epic. It is so hilarious where they're trying to get into the mainframe, Rick. And they tell oh, yeah. the password. It's like, why did you put a complicated password? Then no one can use it. it just something along those lines. It was really funny. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about the, the teenager that was uh, convicted of hacking into SeaWorld. And uh, is a 14-year-old British teenager. Um, and ap apparently in the UK, even though he... Uh, it was proven, it sounds like, in court, that he had a significant and detrimental financial effect. And that was his intent, yet uh, he caused, you know, uh, $500,000 uh, in damage, um, but was let go because they said there's no reason to put a teenager like that in, in prison. So uh, he'll be going to a youth uh, re rehabilitation uh, in the U.K., in other words, MI6 has, has got their horns on him now. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. going to say, yeah. he's going to get recruited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I can say that because yep. I'm already on how many lists, so I'm good. Like, it's okay. Yeah, but. I, yeah I'm sure he's going to enjoy his re rehabilitation yeah. experience. <laughs> the teenager showed up deeply apologetic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, ap apparently he didn't like the, the, uh, the whole thing with SeaWorld and its treatment of animals and also uh, targeted the Japanese town of Taiji, where there's an annual dolphin hunt that takes place and, and crash computers there as well. Um, so it was hacktivism at its finest. And uh, yeah, now you're probably right. He's working for MI6. Yeah. Kind well, of summer internship, he, at least. He, yeah. he, he's got himself a nice career to find and, uh, you know, good for him. Uh, let's hope he doesn't go to jail because that would suck for him. Uh, but that happened in the UK. I think here in the US, that story doesn't play out as nicely. No, it probably doesn't uh, have I'm a happy in, ending here. In the US, I, I think the, the, the laws have been uh, not quite as lenient uh, in that type of behavior. No, in fact, right, haven't we seen in the US is the exact opposite? I mean, it's, it's things that when we were kids would be called pranks that are now called felonies. Mm -hmm. I, it's, uh, it's crazy. Yeah. We've, we've, we're a little overly sensitive on stuff. You think? <laughs> <coughs> By a little bit, Paul. We got to talk about the you know, the the yeah. IOT where do you want to go next? Insecurity, pinpointing the problems. Look, you and I talk about this every week, so I'm curious. Uh, this particular article from uh, Threat Post. Yeah. You think they got it right? I I don't I don't know. I I I think that. Um Everyone always goes back to Shodan to talk about uh, how there's insecure devices on the internet, um, and we all knew that. And, and Chris Poulin's actually recorded in here was on the show uh, recently. I, I think they got it right when they said that uh, the title the subheading is "Can't Update." And I was just going to point that out. I, I agreed with that. 
that's, I mean, that's a problem that we've talked about. And we've talked about companies that have gotten that right. And I, I will admit that as skeptical as I was of Ring, they got that update part right. And I think yeah. Mike and I talk about that all the time on Startup Security Weekly, which you'll be hearing very soon, um, is that that's one of the things you absolutely have to get right. And there's multiple aspects to it, and you have to get all those aspects correct. However, that's still just one issue. You know, and I, I think it's interesting that everyone always, uh, every almost every article we talk about uh, that references IoT security says there's X tens of thousands of these devices exposed to the internet. And I think that's a problem that we haven't talked about in a while, Michael. Yeah, but it's it's a counting problem, right? It, it's like saying there's there's ten thousand viruses an hour that hit your firewall. Mm. Wait, what? Like viruses firewall? Yeah, it, it's the wrong stuff. Here, here's what I liked about it. It's a can update, but you know, reading it, I, I I was reading it too because this is the first time, at least in my mind, that we've looked at IoT and then we've also said the word you know industrial control or SCADA at the same time. And what I think is interesting about this is it says can update. You know, one of the things you and I talk about a lot is that if you're in one of these startups or if you're not in a startup and you're in an enterprise and you're either bringing one of these devices in or you're looking at creating and using these devices in your enterprise, I think the first question you probably ask is, can and how do we update the firmware? But what I've started to realize is sometimes people say, well, why would we need to do that? No, no, it's going to be purpose-built. It's not going to change. I think the other thing that we've seen pretty consistently for the last two decades is whatever you think the purpose is is awesome, and it's absolutely going to change. And as a result of that, you need to build in some ability to do updates because there are things you don't know about, and you've got to be prepared to deal with them. Well, I think I think, also, I think it's the subtlety that you and I haven't really maybe fleshed out yet. But I think also uh, another issue that – uh, we've addressed in the past that we haven't talked about in a while is how you interact with the device. And there's two ways you interact with it. One is for administration. And as Rick can tell you, right, and Job can tell you, most often the way that we break into a device is we're exploiting the way the administration of that device has been implemented. So admin, admin is bad. Is At, you know, the password, the <laughs> web, the, the web, web interfaces for administration on IoT devices are awesome, right? I mean, it depends on your perspective. Um, I don't see why my thermostat doesn't need a web interface, honestly. Right. And that backdoor password was barely noticeable. <laughs> exactly, and and those are some of the mistakes. But also in the implementation of the usability of the device. So that device probably talks to the cloud, the user has a cloud interface, there's some protocol that device talks to the cloud. That's often exploited as well in something that needs to be looked at. And I, I really, I go back to the interview we did with uh, Ed Scotus a long time ago and he said, you know, if we could come up with a standard for ways that devices are administered, and I'm going to extend that further, can we come up with some secure standards for that and for the ways in which the devices function would be great. Now, the problem is all these devices work slightly differently. Well, and that's I was just the challenge. Yeah, where, where look, I was going to ask because I and I was I'm glad you went there because I was going to ask about that where it says the lack of standards. And you know the thing that we used to say 20 years ago was you know the great thing about security, right? So many standards, choose whatever one you want. Mm. And if you don't like it, yeah, modify it. You don't have to follow it. Do anything you want with it. So I'm looking at this going right. Even if we came up like it, I don't think it's a lack of standards is the challenge. I think it's a lack of singular, enforced, commonly followed practices and standards. I think there's too many standards. And so throwing security into the mix, to me, feels like that same thing that we keep doing, which is, hi, you do all that other stuff, and then here's security over here. Yeah. No one's going to choose that. Yeah, so, so I always like to think of this in terms of stored cross-site scripting. Um, so, <laughs> you know, just to throw the geek nerd on it for a minute. Um, no, That's it's good. It's, uh, I'm going to start using that. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was uh, testing an app uh, this week or last week. I don't remember. Um, and it was it stored cross site scripting endemic in the app. I'm like, but, you know, off in little corners of the app. And, and, and so, custom might, might come back and say, well, hey, that doesn't matter. It's in this little corner. Why do we care? But it's what Paul just said it's not the current use of the technology, it's what future use that this framework or this library of code might have that could potentially impact the uh, security um, uh, context down the road, right? Well, you know, something, so you guys are smarter at this than me, but when I've looked at this type of stuff over like the last 15 years, what I noticed was we used to write stuff that was very locked in and singular, and then we'd bastardize it six ways from Sunday. But then we kind of went through this period where we started to build, okay, here's your base, code, here's your base protocol, here's your extensions. 
and right here's your libraries, here's the other stuff. Did we get away from that, that modular way of doing stuff where we had almost containers and compartments, or? Well, yeah, there's, uh, no, there's no room for all those containers and compartments on IoT <laughs> devices, that's the problem, is Ooh, everyone, okay. everyone, tries exactly. to come up, everyone tries to come up with their own implementation of that, and there's no room. It's not okay. like we're developing a Java application or a .NET application where there's this architecture, there's threat modeling models for those languages, the whole nine yards. Yeah. We're pigeonholed it, into this tiny little thing, and we're like, oh yeah, we gotta, we gotta write our own web server, because no it, one else has done it. It's kind of like the days of old, right? You, you, you're given a box and it's like, hey, you've got 64K of memory right, right. to you know, make this thing sing, dance, and run, and skip at the same time. And you but, can, in fact, the performance you know. of it. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. You so if we're going to go back your... to the days of old, it has to be fast. You can't impact performance. Therefore, I can't do logging. Right. I don't need any of these other things. Yeah, yeah. So okay. you come in and go, well, I want to put this five megabyte framework on it. It's like, oh, that's not going to work. You know, uh, you gotta you gotta invent this thing and grow it from the ground up. And so, technology reinvented, growing from the ground up, uh, is often done badly. Mm. So that goes back to customer. So I'm sorry, Paul. I just wanted to put a fine point on it. Then is that we have a, a remarkable amount of power in this more than we realize. Yes, if it's if it's a, a business to consumer sale. We will get there. Look, I've been spending a lot more time now in the, in the K to 12 space and realizing that, believe it or not, the way they get to consumers is K to 12. Let's start working with middle school and high school kids and, and give them the tools they need to think about this differently. So when they go, well, why is it that way? They don't, we don't just go, cause we have answers and we can arm them to go home and explain it to their parents and their friends and their family. I, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that's gonna be a pretty interesting vector for us to explore on that side. But in the business to business side, customer requirement is a huge deal. And so that goes back to our ability to uh, explain some of the implications of this in a pretty cogent, right, Mr. Robot high level way so that the procurement people go, oh, yeah, it totally makes sense. Okay, I'll put that in. And the legal people go, oh, I'm so glad you brought that to us. That's great. I'll write that in. Is it going to take some time? Yeah, I mean, you're basically tin cupping your way around, uh, begging for time to explain this stuff till they understand it. But if you're in an enterprise today and you think that you want to make a difference, start doing that. Because I, I assure you, if the businesses start requiring it consistently and getting better about asking it, and we decentralize that out and give other people that power, the companies trying to provide it are going to have to start to answer those questions which is going to start to trickle that change. And then I'll work on the consumer side uh, too. Awesome. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming on Security Weekly this week, our regular hosts, Michael and Joff, and our very special guest for this evening, Mr. Rick Farina, the Director of Research and Development for Pony Express. Very excited about Blue Hydra. Our very special guest, John from Forrester Research, because I can never pronounce his last name correctly. I had to practice it, and I got it wrong the whole time. Um, need so, another drink. Yeah, I need another drink. Thanks, everyone. For watching we will see everyone next week on security weekly then we're taking a week off for black hat and defcon so uh thanks everyone for watching and over and out